All right, our first speaker of the, the um, second part of our morning is uh, Rob Ritchie. You're from all the way up from UC Berkeley campus, uh, also at LBL at times. Talk to us today about uh, stru the structural materials. So. Well, thank you very much. I, as Chris said, I'm going to talk about structural materials. I want to talk about how the properties, particularly the fracture properties of structural materials, relate to their microstructure over multiple length scales and how we look at that at the ALS. Uh, like most talks you've heard in the last few days, the cast of thousands in the author list, um, I'm just the guy that sits down at a desk on campus. I don't do much work. So most of the work has been done by my postdocs, uh, Rishi Bale, who did all the work on the high temperature materials, and Holly Bath, and particularly Liz Zimmerman on the biological materials. I want to talk about biological and uh, structural materials. And there is the group, of course, at the ALS, who've been very instrumental in helping us here. Al Alistair McDowell's and his colleagues who have, um, on the tomography line and Eric Stable on the, on the SACS line have been very, very important to us. And we have a couple of collaborators here in industry from Teledyne, which is uh, David Marshall and Brian Cox. So I want to talk about fracture. I want to talk about why things break and, and where the, those resistance, those properties come from in a material. And they come at multiple length scales. I want to look at two examples, a biological material, which is human bone, that's close to us all, and look at where these properties come from and how they can degrade by, for example, aging. And I'm going to talk about things called intrinsic and extrinsic toughening, which are different forms of toughening. These guys come at the nanoscale, and the extrinsic ones come at coarser scales, and we look at them using, in the case of the nanoscale, at least near nanoscale, the SACS, and at the coarser scales we use tomography. And then the second part, I want to talk about engineering structural materials, and these are the latest and greatest materials that are going to revolutionize uh, gas turbine engines and the, and the planes that we fly on. Um, these are these ceramic matrix composites. These have been mission impossible for the last 20 years and are suddenly happening. And we're going to see a ceramic engine probably on a commercial aircraft in the next 20, well, maybe 10 years, but certainly 15 years. And again, I'm, these are very complicated materials. And we're going to talk about how we characterize their structure. And we look at the damage, the fracture mechanisms in these materials at extraordinarily high temperatures, which we can do now with a tomography line at the ALS. So first of all, what's fracture? Fracture is, of course, why things break. But fracture really is a competition between mechanisms. You take a crack and you look at what drives that crack forward. It's damage in the crack, head of the crack. You know, uh, dislocations, breaking particles, voids, folding around particles. That's what drives a crack forward. How do you make a material tougher, more resistant to fracture? Obviously, you make these, these processes more difficult. And the primary way of doing that in most metallic materials is to use what I call intrinsic toughening. And the main factor there is plasticity. Plastic deformation alleviates the high stresses and is the primary source of intrinsic toughening, virtually all of which occurs ahead of the crack tip. This is, of course, ductility. Plasticity gives rise to ductility, which improves the toughness. But you have ceramic materials or brittle materials like glass, silicon, or silicon carbide ceramics, which don't have any ductility. Up to now, they've been basically impossible to use structurally because they break catastrophically. But we can generate a sort of pseudo-ductility by a process called shielding by having processes that take place behind the crack tip, which shield the crack from the applied driving forces. These are type bridging mechanisms. Fibers in a fiber composite carry load that would otherwise be used to propagate the crack. It's like if I put a toffee in your mouth. You can't open and close your mouth quite effectively, and the toffee basically is a bridging. There's also wedging mechanisms in fatigue, and that's like having a donut in your mouth. You can't close your mouth so effectively. These are not very scientific, seemingly scientific mechanisms, but they're extraordinarily potent when it comes to toughening. And they operate behind the crack tip, and they pertain to the growth of a crack, not its initiation. So we have these things called R curves. The stress intensity is a measure of the toughness. You may have heard of it, K1C. Most people characterize it at the initiation of a crack. This is the crack extension. But cracks grow, and they grow stably. And there's a large portion of toughness here, which is the what we call the crack growth toughness, which originates from these mechanisms. Now, the competition between these mechanisms is prevalent in all materials, but particularly biological. And when we get to ceramic composites, there isn't any intrinsic toughness. There isn't any ductility. We have to live by these mechanisms. So that's what I'm going to look at today. 
So let's we'll look basically at, at nature first. We'll look at bone, where the toughening comes over multiple length scales. And then we'll look at these ceramic composites. These are ALS uh, tomography pictures. And these are primarily silicon carbide, very brittle material, reinforced by silicon carbide, which, as I said, will probably re revolutionize aerospace engines as we know them today. So how do we look at these multiple length scales? We have to look, we have to look at all the way from macro to near nano. So we do fraction mechanics tests at the macro scale. These are fracture tests. We use fraction mechanics. We measure the toughness. We look at the micro scale with a combination of techniques. I like to use in situ techniques prim primarily. And the tomography can be done in situ, but not with bone, because it basically the, the x-rays destroy the bone. So we use in bone, we, look at, we use tomography to map out crack paths and so forth. I'll explain that to you. We also do a lot of in situ SEM, which is, doesn't sound so sexy, but is very potent. It's only two dimensional, of course, but we can see exactly how cracks interact with the structure. When we get down to the hundreds of nanometers and tens of nanometers, we tend to use the SACS and wide angle x ray diffraction techniques at the ALS, where we can look at, again, in situ deformation and see where the plasticity comes from. This pertains to fractures, pertains to plasticity. And then we also venture down to smaller scales by doing things like AFM, and we look at, look at a lot of. Um, cross-linking issues associated with collagen in bone, but I won't talk so much about that. So we're going to ride up and down this line. So we're dealing initially with bone, and bone, of course, has this multiple length scale hierarchical structure all the way from uh, peptide chains twisted as collagen molecules. You then twist them into fibrils, collagen fibrils, minerals deposited on them with a very regular spacing. You can see that here. That spacing there is the spacing of the mineral. Then the Fibrils are, are twisted into fibers, and then we have a mat. We're up in the micron scale now. And of course, bone remodels at the t hundreds of micron scale by these osteonal structures, which are channels where the blood vessels sit. And as the, 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 the bone grows out, these, these osteons grow in size and, and provide the interface between new bone and old bone. So bone has this hierarchical structure, as I said, all the way from collagen mineral fibrils in the micron fibers up to the Haversian canals and osteonal structures. We can identify toughening mechanisms at every one of these scales, literally. And pr primarily, we can subdivide them into this intrinsic-extrinsic notion I talked about. Below about a micron, the, pr the process is associated with intrinsic toughening, which is plasticity. And bone primarily derives its plasticity by a sliding of fibrils collagen fibrils or collagen fibers technique. This is this process here. Basically, mineralized collagen fibers or mineralized collagen fibrils slide apart. And this is basically a plasticity mechanism. Now, that is affected by the cross-linking of those collagens. That's a very important factor. But that's where the intrinsic toughening of bone comes from. But an even bigger effect is the extrinsic effect associated with the growth of cracks in bone. And then we get a whole variety of techniques, which are similar to what you see in ceramics. There are, you'll see collagen fibrils that actually span a crack and bridge it. We can generate bridges in just by having the fact that bone micro cracks as it gets older. And the little spaces between the micro cracks, we talk about mother and daughter cracks here. That's the mother crack. These are the daughter cracks. And the little spaces in between are uncracked regions, which carry load. They're bridges, too. And you've got these wonderful osteonal structures which go along the length of the bone. The interface of those osteons are mineral-based, and the cracks deflect there. In fact, these little micro-cracks form at those osteonal structures primarily. So we have a variety. And this, is, of course, is deflection. And when a crack deflects from the plane of maximum tensile stress, it takes a larger load to, to drive it. So these are the extrinsic mechanisms. These are the intrinsic. I'll just show you a quick movie of this where you can see these things. This is a crack in bone. And if I propagate this crack, it's coming. Now, I'll just stop it here. What you're going to see here, you can start to see these little uncracked ligaments forming here. They're just like an, on echelon cracks in earthquakes. But here, there is going to be an osteon. And that osteonal boundary will be cracked because it's high mineral content. And as this crack approaches that weak interface, it will deflect. It's a classic toughening mechanism seen in wood and other materials crack stopping at weak interfaces. And when the crack deflects, the main crack here will branch out. It will deflect and form several cracks. And that lessens the driving force for any individual crack. And that's a toughening mechanism. And this is all taking place at 
fairly small. It's crack growth, but the cracks are extremely small. So let's run this through again. Carry on here. Now it's encountering that broken interface. There's another uncracked ligament. You can see fibrils bridging the crack in that crack there as well. And if we play this through com to completion, the crack encounters the weak interface and, and starts to deflect. You get a complex fracture pattern. And that is a strong toughening mechanism. That's how windshields actually toughen by these many, many cracks that form. So that's the extrinsic mechanisms in bone. Now we can see these in the ALS very effectively in tomography. This is a three-dimensional picture of a crack in bone. There are those, the light blue there are the osteonal structures. The plane of the crack is that white region there. The crack front is there. The black region is all unbroken, and there's one of those uncracked ligaments behind the crack tip, which basically acts as a bridge. There we have the same thing in dentin. This is, there are these little, there's a mother crack and a daughter, some bunch of daughter cracks. Uh, and you can see these regions in between are big bridges. They're big toppies inside your mouth, effectively, that basically will prevent the crack from opening. Um, that's the bridging mechanisms. The other ones are the deflection mechanisms. Uh, and this is the cracks. These are the osteons I talked about in a different orientation now. And as the crack encounters those osteons, it will deflect. There's the three-dimensional image. Holly Bath took this one for me. And if you take sections into that image, you can see how the crack will deflect as it encounters various osteons in three dimensions. The resulting crack path is highly irregular. The crack path, if it went along the plane of maximum tensile stretch, would be along this plane here. But you can see it comes down here. It sees this osteon. It deflects up here. It sees that osteon. It deflects here. These highly irregular paths are a very important toughening mechanism in bone. And we, can, we have to see this in three dimensions. This is a three-dimensional deflection process which, of course, the tomography can give us. So how does, this, what, how does this degrade when it comes to you know, biological fact? This is aging. This is, a, this is bone at 35 years old, toughness versus crack extension. As we get older, 70 years old, and there we have 90-year-old. There's a massive reduction in the, in the initiation toughness and the growth toughness, which is the slope of this curve. Can we interpret this? Well, if we look at what's going on from the extrinsic point of view, this is young bone, this is old bone. Note those little bridges I talked about. They're much, much smaller in old bone. Why is that? The bridges form at the osteons, the osteonal boundaries. And one thing that happens when you grow old, you get many more osteons. This is young bone, this is old bone, and these sort of seaweed-type things are the osteonal structures. Your bone remodels more. So basically, the spacing between these osteons drops, and the size of these bridges drops. So the toffee gets smaller, effectively, as you get older. That's one of the degradation mechanisms that we see in bone. And there's a strong correlation of the toughness versus the osteonal density that supports that. That's the extrinsic effect. The intrinsic effect, well, things degrade. That's young collagen. That's old collagen. This looks beautiful. This looks a complete mess. We do ramen, and we can see a signature on the amide 1 peak that is very strong as the material gets older, which is indicative of a change in the environment, the collagen environment. We look at this in the SAPS line at the ALS. We do an experiment. This is Liz Zimmerman's work, where we take a sample. We pull a tensile sample in the X-ray beam, and we look at the small angle and wide angle X-ray diffraction patterns. This is a Fratzel experiment, basically. Uh, the, the, um, the, the, the wide angle gives us the mineral, the diffraction from the mineral, which, of course, is crystalline, so we can see the the, the, the fraction patterns in the mineral, but the collagen has this mineral space very regularly al along it, every 67 nanometers, and we can get a pattern from that as well. So we can put a strain on the bone and then measure the individual strains in the collagen and the mineral. We can partition the strain. Now, forget the minerals, not much strain in the mineral, but if we look at the collagen, remember the plasticity in the collagen is generated, in the bone is generated by fibril sliding, the collagen fibers sliding apart. When we look at young bone, there is, for example, the strain in the bone, the sample strain, and this is the strain in the collagen alone. If we look at a strain, say, of 0.9% uh, uh, here, when we look at young bone, the majority of the strain is carried by the collagen, as you might expect. There's plenty of fibril sliding. But if you look at old bone, much, much less strain is carried by the collagen. Why? Because the collagen embrittles, basically. And why does it embrittle? 
this fibrillar sliding mechanism is not so effective. And it's not so effective because it cross-links. And we got, this is a longer story, but we can measure the cross-links in young and old bone, and the particular type of cross-links called uh, the non-enzymatic cross-links. But this is what locks up that fibrillar sliding mechanism and reduces the plasticity in the bone. So your teeth is much the same. They, they get more brittle with age because that intrinsic mechanism of plasticity is less effective. So you can see here, when we, we talk about bone, we go along these, this, this, this sort of arrow here. The extrinsic contributions to toughness are from shielding, deflection, and bridging. And the things that affect them are the osteonal density or the spacing. There's also mineralization. I haven't talked about that, but that's affected by disease. But there's the intrinsic contribution, which is associated with plasticity, much smaller scale, and that involves this fibrillar sliding. And there, the collagen cross-linking is the important aspect. So that's the bone story. Now, what about structural materials? There is a revolution taking in aerospace now, which is associated with composites. Composites have been around for 40 years, but they're finally getting into aerospace. This is the new, um, uh, what is it, the F-18 fighter. And that pink area is all epoxy re uh, carbon-reinforced epoxy airframe. And you probably know the new Boeing's 787 Dreamliner is essentially a plastic airplane. So that's happening as we speak now. But there's an even bigger, bigger effect, and that is associated with the temperature which we run the engine. The efficiency of a gas turbine engine increases as we increase the temperature. If you look at the progress since the Second World War, the, the increased performance of gas turbines can be almost directly traced to the temperature in that combustor, the materials that can stand the temperatures that, press, uh, that, that we have. We're up around here now, and we get those temperatures because we have a material called a nickel-based superalloy, which can't operate much above 1150 degrees centigrade, which, by the way, is almost at 80 to 90 percent of its melting temperatures. And we rely on massive cooling, and we rely on coatings, thermal barrier coatings. There's nowhere else to go. The only place we can go, really, is ceramics. If we had ceramics, we could run the temperature two, three, four hundred degrees higher. People kill for a five degree increase in temperature now, so ceramics would be wonderful. The problem with ceramics is the first pigeon you ingest in the engine, you've lost your engine. That's the problem. So now there's been, why can't we use ceramic composites and in, invoke these bridging mechanisms I just talked about? Now, th as I said, this has been Mission Impossible for a while, but because of GE primarily, who have been really trailblazing on that, these materials are becoming a reality. They can provide 20 to 30% reduction in weight of the engine, which is just massive. There's no cooling required of these blades, and, and, so the, and they're, much, they're much lighter than conventional metallic blades. So it's a huge emphasis. But we're looking at one stage beyond that, and that's using them for critical parts of airframes. And this is the hypersonic flight. This is the uninsulated space shuttle, basically. And now we're looking at even higher temperatures. We're looking at 14, 15, and maybe 1,600 degrees centigrade. These materials are horribly complicated, but they are woven fibers. They're basically three-dimensional architectures of ca carbon or, or graphite or silicon carbide fi fibers woven into a matrix which contains chopped fibers and all sorts of gradients and what have you. I won't go into all the details, but if you see their temperature versus strength, these are the only materials in town that can take us beyond that barrier of about 1,200 degrees centigrade that we now have. Now, there's these, as I said, they're three-dimensional materials. We need to understand not only their structure, but the damage mechanisms. Do the cracks form in the matrix? And do they laminate along the fibers? Is there coding cracks? This needs to be understood in three dimensions. How do you do that? Tomography provides that solution. So we use tomography to look at these materials. We've got two basic materials. This is a weave of carbon fibers in a silicon carbide matrix there. They're about seven, uh, seven micron diameter fibers, but it's just like knitting here. It's a highly weave. And we've got an individual toe of a fiber. This is now um, a silicon carbide fibers as opposed to um, carbon fibers, again, infiltrated in a silicon carbide matrix. These fibers have to have a coating on to make them, the interface is brittle, so they'll slide. It's a pyrolithic carbon in this case, and it's a graphite in this case. So we do the tomography on this. And first of all, we have to characterize the structure. And this is pretty mundane stuff, but we have to look at all these things and we characterize the shapes and sizes and the stresses and the distortions and the positions of every fiber in three dimensions using tomography. And this then is fed into a technique called a geometry generator, which gives us then 
uh, um, an artificial e-material, a, 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 a material in the computer, which has all the correct statistics of these actual materials, which are highly stochastic in nature. But the most important thing is, can we see the damage in these materials when we, when we, when we fail them, when we try to deform them? But it's not enough to do it at room temperature. We have to do it at these unbelievably high temperatures. So we've developed here at the Light Source with Alistair Alice McDowell and crew a facility for doing tensile loading, and we can do bending loading eventually, of these materials in the beam line at temperatures as high as 1,700 degrees centigrade. Actually, we can go even higher. We can get to about 2,300 degrees centigrade if we needed to. This is, this is the facility. This rotates in the beam. It's like the size of a bowling trophy. Um, the the, um, the x-rays come in through a little window here. It's a little 200 micron aluminum window. That's a difficult thing. It's got to be thin enough to give transmission of the beam, but it's also got to be thick enough to hold the actual uh, thing together. There's a load cell up here. We have a little stepper motor that drives it. We have a uh, load cell, and we have LBDT to measure the stress-strain curves. And we, power, we, we heat this thing up with three um, halogen 150-watt um, lamps above and three below. So we have a little hot zone about the size of a half a centimeter sphere in the center of the sample. And of course, we send the x-ray through. So we can do a tensile test at 1,700 degrees centigrade. That alone is pretty spectacular. No one's done that kind of thing before. But we can, at the same time, visualize in three dimensions at about just under a micron resolution the damage mechanisms. Let me show you some quick pictures of this. This is the device itself glowing hot. We can pull a vacuum in here. We can put a load of about two, uh, two kilonewtons. There is the device, you can, uh, and you can see the hot zone in it. Um, this thing loads up in seconds, by the way, when you, when you hook, it doesn't take a long time to heat it up. So this is some, some data. This is up in the top left-hand corner here is the tensile test, and this is one of these silicon carbide, silicon carbide samples. And if you look at this sample, we can visualize the damage. We can image the damage as the tensile test takes place. You can start seeing these trans, uh, uh, transverse cracks forming here and here and here. And in low temperatures, this is only at 27 degrees centigrade, you get multiple cracking forming. And you might be able to see the bridging of the fibers here as well. Well, that's not no big deal. But can we do this at high temperature? And this is the first one we did at 1750 degrees centigrade. This has never been done before. I don't think even a tensile test has been done at these sort of temperatures. And you can see the same thing happening here, but a very different type of cracking. There's not multiple cracking now. There's a single crack which then bifurcates. We can see all the bridging in between, and we have the exact stress-strain curve as it goes along. So we've able to visualize this very difference in the behavior of the cracks at room temperature and high temperature as a function of load. Now, by the way, this fact of bridging is absolutely critical. These fibers have to retain their uh, integrity. Otherwise, the material is just extremely brittle and will fail as the first pigeon, basically. So this these are very interesting from the point of view of getting the differences in mechanisms. But the important thing about tomography is you can measure or we can quantify the data. These are the cracks. We can see where the cracks are. We can measure the number of fibers, each fiber that's broken. We can measure the amount of pullout of those fibers, where the toughening comes from. Those are those blue lines there. We know exactly where their lengths are. The data here is just so rich. And more important than that, we can actually see the opening displacements of these cracks. Again, this color scale here tells us the width of the crack. And that is so-called COD, crack open displacement, which is a fundamental parameter which governs the toughness of these materials. So this kind of information gives us a constitutive law for fracture in these materials, which is the essence of a computational model for predicting their failure. And you can see these, uh, how these open displacements, they're much, much higher, as you might expect, at 1,700 degrees centigrade as opposed to room temperature. And all this data is, can be easily generated, and we can visualize this in all these different temperatures with, with, with ease. Just to, to finalize, we can also do this in the carbon silicon carbide. This is the more of a composite type sample. Same thing here. You can see how the crack will come in. It'll, it'll tra uh, traverse this particular toe then it will start to delaminate along those, that bundle of fibers. This is at 1,700 degrees centigrade. We have the full stress strain curve of this happening. And what we've tried to do now is put this into a computational model. What we're trying to do here is virtual design. These materials are so complicated that we won't be able to do experimental tests 
in large sections, so there's going to have to be some degree of computational testing for these materials. Now, that's a, a, a very dangerous term. You want to do experiments. You don't want to do everything in the computer, but if you put enough physics into it, it'll work. So the, we have this, what's called a virtual pipeline. This is what we do with Teledyne. We characterize the materials in the synchrotron. They, we then build these, these uh, uh, synthetic materials in the computer, which have all the characteristics of the ones we characterize. We put those into a particular geometry of a particular part. We add these constitutive laws that I've talked about that we can measure looking at damage at temperature under load in the synchrotron, and then we can do predictions. This is the first one that's been done. This has been done by Queen de Yan in Miami. There is one of these full samples that's undergoing loading, and you can see the cracks on the interfaces. And here is the 2D, the only in 2D now, simulations of this, so it's the computation of this in these Monte Carlo uh, cohesive zone models. So we're getting to the point where we can actually have this physics-based but virtual design pipeline to, to use these materials. So let me conclude by saying I've tried to use, uh, to describe two types of, of structural materials, one biological, one synthetic, um, one, of course, bone close to our, our heart, and the other one, a new material that I think will revolutionize um, aerospace in the near future. The ALS is very important for two reasons. One, we can get high fidelity images of the cracking paths, these extrinsic mechanisms. We can see this in three dimensions and we can quantify it, but we can also use the SACS lines to look at plasticity at the smaller levels. And I finally described a facility which I think is unique in the world now, where we can actually do tensile tests under load um, in the beam line at these unprecedented temperatures and get all the data that we require in three dimensions for a virtual design uh, predictive model for these very complicated ceramic matrix composite materials. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for maybe one, one question. Yes. So what happens after the first pigeon? <laughs> with, the, with the second pigeon? <laughs> well, you know, there's a famous example of this, and this is Rolls-Royce, the RB211 engine, which was the first composite engine that was built in the 70s. And the last test they do is they fire a dead chicken into the engine. And in the case of the Rolls-Royce engine, it shredded the engine. And Rolls-Royce went bankrupt over this. Rolls-Royce engines now is called Rolls-Royce Great Britain Limited. It was taken over by the British government. And it almost brought down Lockheed. So this is not a trivial thing. And, and when they looked at these, when they looked at these, um, into metallic blades in G, the last test they did killed it. They fired a dead chicken in the engine, the brittle materials shred them. So this is major, major issue. There was a plane somewhere last week that crashed because of ingesting a bird on takeoff. So it's, it's not a trivial issue, it really isn't. All right, well, thank you very much.